to be here. I'm going to talk about unicorns and family businesses and what each can learn from the other. But before that, I want to make two comments. One on what Minister Rajiv Chandrasekhar said this morning and one what Nilesh Bhai just uh, said. So one lesson which both unicorns and family businesses can learn from the army. The US Marines have a very tough regiment, the training program. You go hungry, you go old, you have hard life, you are alone, etc. If you want to quit, in many of the US Marine training facilities, they have a big bed in the center. And you have to simply go and ring the bell. And that enables you to say, I'm out, I'm fed up, I can't deal with this, I'm out. In the history of US Marines, almost nobody has run that way. So if you want to be a successful family business, or if you want to be a successful unicorn creator, never ring the bell. So that was a lesson I thought of when Rajiv Chandrasekhar was talking. Nilesh Bhai just invoked Rama and Krishna. We discussed this in our family quite a bit because we are a very religious family. So, Bhagwan Ram was a follower of rules. Bhagwan Krishna was a breaker of rules. And I tell my children, Ram came first. So please follow the rules. Once you've internalized them, you could selectively and effectively break them. Unicorn creators break the rules. They break the rules intelligently. And I think there's something to be learned both from a Rama consciousness and from a Krishna consciousness. So let me first start by giving some facts about family business. Then I will talk about what unicorns could learn from family businesses and then what family businesses could learn from unicorns. So first of all, family businesses are more common than we think. They are in the top quartile of the business league tables. You can look at this in Germany, USA, Taiwan, Korea, Brazil, India, wherever. I believe, and I'm quoting from I think a Business Standard article I read a year, year and a half ago, that almost two-thirds of India's market cap is family-owned businesses. If you look at Germany, the biggest driver of the German economy are what are known as the little sand companies. These are typically 50 million euro in revenues, although by definition up to a billion dollars, uh, a billion euro in revenues are considered middle market companies. They are niche, they are focused, they are agile and they are global. And almost 68% of German exports come from these middle market family owned uh, businesses. So they are truly a force in the global economy. Let me just give you three examples of family-owned businesses which you would typically not think of as family-owned businesses with different styles of engagement of the family. First, let me talk about Samsung. We all know Samsung. It was started in 1938 by a man called Lee Today, Samsung is about 80 companies, including all its subsidiaries. From electronics to insurance, there are a whole bunch of businesses. Last year's revenue was about $230 billion. His son became chairman, the third son became chairman, and until 2020, Lee Kun Hee was running it. Forbes ranked him amongst the most powerful people in the world. He also was arrested for tax evasion and other mischief. He passed away in 2020. The grandson, Lee Jae Yong, is currently chairman of Samsung, third generation. 
He's 53 years old, he went to Harvard Business School, he's a professional, and he's a very effective creator of what Samsung is today. So many times what we consider multinationals actually have an element of family business sitting there. The second example I want to take is Volkswagen. Volkswagen makes nine or 10 million cars a year. It's, I believe, the world's largest car manufacturer. It's bigger than Toyota, I think they're next to me. It owns Audi, it owns Porsche, it owns Lamborghini, it owns Bentley. So it owns some of the big luxury brands around the world. 54% of the voting rights of Volkswagen are controlled by two families, the Porsche family and the Pish family. So it's a family controlled company. Five members sit on the governing board. They're not in day-to-day -day management. But German governing boards are four, far more active than boards of directors in most other countries. So they found a way of managing Volkswagen, which is very different from the way Samsung is managed, where the executive is a family member. Let me give you a third example. So Nike was started by Phil Knight in 1964. For those who may not remember, at that time, the company was called Blue Ribbon Sports, which became Nike. Revenues are in the range of 35 or 37 billion dollars. His son is Travis Knight. Travis Knight decided he wanted to be a musician. Phil and Travis, father and son, went out and bought a company called Leica Films, which is a leading animation company. Travis worked in middle management of Leica, rose through the ranks, and is right now CEO. Leica has been nominated for Oscars for Best Animated Film, Best Visuals, etc. It's actually never won. So here's a third example where there's a global company called Nike with no family involvement, but there are smaller businesses that the family has created with family. So all of these models work, and it's up to us to find out which model is appropriate for us and good for us. Let me now come to what I believe family businesses can teach unicorns. Firstly, I think family businesses can teach continuity. Family businesses tend to play for the long term. They are not diverted, and that's why I forgive me, by the stock market. <laughs> they are not diverted by the constant need for fundraising, which inevitably unicorns need to do. And they are not affected by the noise around them, or they are less affected by the noise around them. There was a study by McKinsey several years ago, which collaborated that. Family businesses typically have a higher reinvestment rate as a percentage of profits. Family businesses typically have a higher R&D spend as a percentage of revenues, which is the same long-term orientation. There's a German economic historian called Hamid Berghoff, and he studied family businesses across Europe, and he found certain characteristics that were common. One was emotional attachment. Two was lean hierarchies. Third was nimbleness, which is why these German middle market companies are so global. McKinsey did a similar study and found similar things. They found that family businesses have strong identities, which we see all around us. They have higher trust and they have a shared sense of destiny. I think unicorns can learn from this. Amy Chua is a professor at Yale and she wrote a famous book called Tiger Moms, which effectively talks about why immigrants are so successful in the United States. And she found three traits amongst immigrants that makes them stand out. One is they think they are superior. At the same time, they are insecure because they need to prove themselves. They are in a new land. And thirdly, they have tremendous impulse control. And this combination I see in family businesses repeatedly. The element of frugality, 
I want to just stress for more. Because it dissipates less energy. It leads to focus and it leads to a sense of perseverance. Again, I think these are lessons technology entrepreneurs can learn from family business. There are trust networks that family businesses invoke. Francis Fukuyama wrote a book which is called Trust. And it says communities or societies which have high levels of trust, whether it is a business level, ecosystem level, country level, prosper more than countries and societies who do not have trust. Family businesses often rely on these trust networks. So whether you see the Bangladeshi network in the UK where almost 80% of the small Indian restaurants are actually run by Bangladeshis from one district. Whether you see the Gujarati trading communities in Africa, all of these are run as family businesses on very strong trust network. Ratan Tata is famous for saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Family businesses subscribe to this view. So sometimes, family businesses are slow because they want to go far. They don't necessarily want to go fast. I was talking to Anil Agarwal, who is chairman of Vedanta. And I asked him, so what's your secret? It was a dumb question to ask. But anyway, nevertheless, I asked him. And he answered, dribbling. He says, you have to just play the game every single day. The way the ball is bowled to you, you have to just keep batting, keep dribbling. And he gave an example. When he was trying to build Vedanta, he wanted to attract eminent people on the board of directors of Vedanta. And it was difficult. Because it was at that time an unknown company. They were going to list in London and he wanted some board member who was a well-known figure in the commodities industry. And Anil Agarwal wanted to meet him. So he found out that this gentleman, whose name I can't remember, was going bicycling. So Anil Agarwal actually went bicycling with a man he never knew to get to know him. Because that was his hunger. He says, I need the credibility. I need to engage with this man. I will bicycle with him for half an hour. And I will convince him to join my book. And exactly that. The last thing I think family businesses can teach unicorns is what not to do, which is conglomeratization. A lot of family businesses become overly diversified. They lose focus because they have temptations, I suppose, to employ various family members and so on and so forth. When I hear Ola starting Ola Electric, I sometimes wonder whether the tech sector is going through too much conglomeratization and whether it will affect them badly. Now let me come to what family businesses can learn from unicorns. The first thing is the confidence and the energy of the entrepreneur. Family businesses tend to get complacent because of their legacy. Entrepreneurs tend to be energetic and sometimes you can say it's foolish energy. I would buy foolish energy over complacency any day. Okay. Krishna consciousness. Second, many legacy businesses don't have insights on markets, the market segments they want to address, that entrepreneurs find. I see it in segment after segment. Young entrepreneurs come with market size data, how to crack a particular problem, which <coughs> legacy businesses do. So there's something to develop that insight. I want to talk about empowerment. Young companies have no choice but to empower their young colleagues. And this trust works both ways. It works where you empower an executive to make critical decisions which a family business would never dare to. Okay, so that's one leap of faith they make and they are actually succeeding. Second, the manager knows if he makes a mistake, he'll be forgiven for taking a risk. Because it is inevitable when you make big decisions, some of them will be wrong. So the ability to make mistakes is something I think we can learn from unicorns. The next thing I think our family businesses can learn from unicorns is ambition. 
we tend to think typically incrementally. Can I grow at 20% or 15% or 25%? A unicorn founder wants to grow 10x, not 20%. When you want to grow 10x and when you plan to grow 10x, you do everything differently. So when we were in business school, we studied what was known as the Galbraith Star Model. So the Galbraith Star Model said that a company consists of various elements. There's a strategy, there's structure, there are people, the kind of people you hire, there's a decision-making process, there are reward systems, and encompassing all of these are the symbols that a company has. When you want to go 10x, you have to actually redefine all of these elements as you grow. What made you successful in the first two, three years of your life will not make you successful in the next five years of your life. So I think this 10x thinking is something I've learned from entrepreneurs. Tenacity is another thing I've learned from entrepreneurs. Every entrepreneur I know has gone through existential dilemmas. I'm reading a book on Roman emperors. The Roman emperors went through existential dilemmas. Elon Musk went through near bankruptcy in an existential dilemma three odd years ago. Okay, today he's the richest man in the world. A positive thing that entrepreneurs have taught me is alchemy. Alchemy is the science of turning ordinary metal into gold. Entrepreneurs turn ordinary metal into gold all the time. They take an ordinary idea and they build a fortune. Right? Steve Jobs had what was known as a reality distortion field around him. He could convince people to do the impossible. That's a part of this idea. The lesson from Amazon is you have to have day one thinking. An entrepreneur on day one has high hopes, zero complacency, lots of energy. And Amazon today claims they do day one thinking every day. Therefore, family businesses ought to do day one thinking every day. The last point I want to make, and we were talking about it at breakfast this morning, is Warren Buffett says, intelligence is overrated. And he poses a challenge to young people. And he says, if you need to give up 20 points of your IQ, what will you give it up for? You have to give it up. What do you want in return? People may answer different things. Somebody will say, better work ethic, etc., etc. Warren Buffett would say, temperament. If I were asked that question, I would say, irrationality. Give up 20 points of your IQ, get some irrationality. If Zelensky was totally rational, he would have succumbed to the Russians. He would not have fought. If Dhirubhai Ambani was completely rational, he would not have, not have dared to create reliance. If Steve Jobs was completely rational, he wouldn't have tried to come back into a company called Apple from where he had been fired. So a little bit of irrationality all the best. I do believe the world events are cyclical. So we go through phases of opening up, contraction, opening up, and building, etc., etc. And we are shaped by recent memory. And there are institutional imperatives where we overshoot. Which is why you can explain why institutional investors from around the world are selling, because they do a very top down asset allocation. This is why government leaders or business leaders make mistakes because we look at very short-term information. And the trick therefore is to write this book and therefore to think longer term. I've been reading this book by Ray Dalio. It's called The New World Order. And an argument he makes in that book, uh, Ray Dalio, by the way, is the world's largest hedge fund uh, manager. They manage $150 billion or something like that. And he says the Chinese think in 100-year cycles, in 100-year terms, because that's how their dynasties used to be. Asians tend to think in longer cycles. The Western world tends to think in shorter cycles. They think in one generation or two generation cycles, which are 30-year cycles. So you have to think both in terms of 30-year cycles, overreaction to the near term and secular trends which are long-term, 100-year cycles. And if I look at both the short-term cycle for it may end, and certainly the long-term cycles of demographic dividend, etc., for a country like India, I can say I'm maximum growth. 
Unicorns are created by three or four different factors that work together. One, they are created by going after fast growth markets. Investors reward fast growth over considerations like what's your gross margin currently, etc., etc. So they go after fast growth niches. Two, they have deep ESOP goals. They create confidence in the financing community that we are here to stay. We have deep ESOP goals. It's not just two founders or three founders who are building the business. And we'll be able to attract the best talent there is. Family businesses are often reluctant to do that. Third, I believe unicorns valuation is motion. Let's assume a unicorn was valued at 50 million dollars and then it's valued at 200 million dollars and then it's valued at 500 and a billion. A lot of the new capital that comes in has what is known as liquidation preference, which is if you shut down, I get my money out first at the last round financing. And if he came in before me, he gets his money after me but before everyone else. And if he came before that, he gets his money before common equity, which are the founders and the employees, get their share. So very often, this billion dollar or a multi-billion dollar valuation is motion. Fourth, investors pay for optionality. They are taking a portfolio approach. They are saying, here is a company, it's fast growing. This worked in America, this worked in Vietnam, this worked in Indonesia, chances are it will work in India. So they are taking that kind of a portfolio approach and, and optionality. Remember, the sequoias of the world are very different from Warren Buffett's of the world. Sequoias of the world make bulk of their money in less than a third of their portfolio. They are happy to write down a lot of their investments. Family businesses don't have that temperament and are not even suggesting that they should. The last point I want to make is, and we will see this, a lot of the unicorn valuations are dead wrong. In the correction of 2000, Amazon corrected 80% or something. Facebook right now is happening. So a lot of these valuations are just voting machines, not weighing machines, because they don't have the earnings and everything else to support it. And you may find a lot of this will be dead meat uh, a few years from now. I'm not sure I understand the question, but I think the question is, in a volatile environment, how should you approach your family business? I think, as in the stock market, as in the business world, you have to write what you Nothing stays forever. Unless the secular characteristics of your business are going away. So for instance, in the cement business, there is a theme of consolidation. So if you're a very small cement company, you can say the secular trend is such that below a certain threshold of size, I will not survive. And therefore, either I have to grow. And if I can't grow for whatever reason, then I have to exit. So you have to see whether your challenges are secular in nature or cyclical in nature. And more often than not, I believe they are cyclical in nature. And therefore, you have to write that word. And you have to create a buffer, which is more management. And I think I've learned this in business. Intent comes first. Resources follow. So once you have the intent to write, resources 